Hello, and today uh, it's going to be a Jackanory session, if you like. Uh, for those of you of a certain age, you will probably remember the uh, program Jackanory. It used to be on, I think, every every weekday, actually. Um, and this is my Jackanory. Uh, for those of you who are of a religious flavour, you could look at it as the uh, the Sunday sermon, although it would be a Sunday secular sermon. Uh, basically, um, with the events which have happened over the last few weeks, uh, it brought to mind a book that I had read some time back, uh, a book which I'd like to share some passages with you, um, just to give us an understanding as to uh, crowds and the power of crowds. Before I get into it, though, uh, I want to give a big thank you uh, to um, Luke and Sue. Um, I've been doing this channel actively since 2018. And uh, Luke and Sue uh, bought me a coffee because uh, that's something which I found that you could put on your things, uh, on, on your uh, channel. And because they bought me a copy, a, a coffee uh i managed to uh, get paid for 15 pounds now that is the sum total of all the videos which i've done um since 2018 it represents my first payout if you like online payout so i'm truly grateful to luke and sue if anybody else would like to buy me a coffee please feel free to do so much appreciated so back on to the main subject uh, this is uh, Elias uh, Canetti, and uh, he is the author of a book called Crowds and Power. And I'm going to read some uh, extracts from uh, Crowds and Power. Uh, stand by and listen to. There is nothing that man fears more than the touch of the unknown. He wants to see what is reaching towards him and to be able to recognize or at least classify it. Man always tends to avoid physical contact with anything strange. In the dark, the fear of an unexpected touch can mount to panic. Even clothes give insufficient security. It is easy to tear them and pierce through them to the naked, smooth, defenseless flesh of the victim. All distances which men create around themselves are dedicated by this fear. They shut themselves in houses which no one may enter, and only there feel some measure of security. The fault of burglars is not only the fear of being robbed, but also the fear of a sudden and unexpected clutch out of the darkness. The repugnance to being touched remains with us when we go among other people. The way we move in a busy street, in restaurants, trains or buses is governed by it. Even when we are standing next to them and are able to watch and examine them closely, we avoid actual contact if we can. If we do not avoid it, it is because we feel attracted to somebody. And then it is we who make the approach. The promptness with, with which apology is offered for an unintentional contact, the tension which with it is awaited, are violent and sometimes even physical reaction when it is not forthcoming. The antipathy and hatred we feel for the offender, even when we cannot be certain who it is. The whole knot of shifting and intensively, intensively sensitive reactions to an alien touch proves that we are dealing here with a human propensity as deep-seated as it is alert and insidious, something which never leaves a man when he has once established the boundaries of his personality. Even in sleep, when he is far more unguarded, he can all too easily be disturbed by touch. It is only in a crowd that man can become free of his fear of being touched. That is the only situation in which the fear changes into its opposite. The crowd he needs is the dense crowd in which body is pressed to body, a crowd too where physical constitution is also dense or compact, so that he no longer notices who it is that presses against him. As soon as a man has surrendered himself to the crowd, he ceases to fear its touch. Ideally, all are equally there. 
no distinctions count, not even that of sex. The man pressed against him is the same as himself. He feels himself as he feels himself. Suddenly it is though everything were happening in one and the same body. This is perhaps one of the reasons why a crowd seeks to close in on itself. It wants to rid each individual as completely as possible for the fear of being touched. The more fiercely people press together, the more certain they feel that they do not fear each other. This reversal of the fear of being touched belongs to the nature of crowds. The feeling of relief is most striking where the density of the crowd is greatest. The crowd, suddenly there where there was nothing before, is a mysterious and universal phenomenon. A few people may have been standing together, five, ten or twelve, not more. Nothing has been announced. Nothing is expected. Suddenly, everywhere is black with people and more come streaming from all sides as though streets head only one direction. This is about the open and the closed crowd. Most of them do not know what has happened and, if questioned, have no answer, but they hurry to where most other people are. There is a determination in their movement which is quite different from the expression of ordinary curiosity. It seems as though the movement of some of them transmits itself to others, but that is not all. They have a goal, which is there before they can find words for it. This goal is the blackest spot where most people are gathered. This is the extreme form of the spontaneous crowd, and much more will have to be said about it later. It in its innermost core, it is not quite as spontaneous as it appears, but except for those five, ten or twelve people with whom actually it originates. It is everywhere spontaneous as soon as it exists at all. It wants to consist of more people. The urge to grow is the first and supreme attribute of the crowd. It wants to seize everyone within reach. Anything shaped like a human can join it. The natural crowd is the open crowd. There are no limits whatsoever to its growth. It does not recognise houses, doors or locks. Those who shut themselves in are suspect. Open is the, to be understood here in the fullest sense of the word. It means open everywhere and in any direction. The open crowd exists so long as it grows. It disintegrates as soon as it stops growing. For just as suddenly as it originates, the crowd disintegrates. In its spontaneous form, it is a sensitive thing. The openness in which it enables it to grow is, at the same time, its danger. A foreboding or threatening disintegration is always alive in the crowd. It seeks through rapid increase to avoid this for as long as it can. It absorbs everybody and... Because it does, it must ultimately fall to pieces. In contrast to the open crowd, which can grow indefinitely and is uh, of universal interest because it may spring up anywhere, there is the closed crowd. The closed crowd renounces growth and puts the stress on permanence. The first thing to be noticed about it is that it has a boundary. It establishes itself by accepting its illimitation. It creates a space for itself which it will fill, will fill. This space can be compared to a vessel in which liquid is being poured and whose capacity is known. The entrances to this space are limited in number and only those entrances can be used. The boundary is respected whether it consists of stone, of solid wall or some special act of acceptance or entrance fee. Once the space is completely filled, no one else is allowed in. Even if there is an overflow, the important thing is always the dense crowd in the closed room. Those standing outside do not really belong. The boundary presents disorderly increase, but it also makes it more difficult for the crowd to disperse and so postpones the solution. 
In this way, the crowd sacrifices its, its chance of growth, but gains in staying power. It is protected from the outside influences, which could become hostile and dangerous, and it sets its, help, its hope on repetition. It is the expectation of reasonable assembly which enables its members to accept each dispersal. The building is waiting for them. It exists for their sake. And so long as it were, is it, so long as it is there, they will be able to meet the, in the same manner. The space is theirs. Even during, even during the ebb and in its emptiness, it reminds them of the flood. I suppose what they're talking about here is a, fo a football stadium or a nightclub, you could say. The, att the attributes of the crowd. Before I try to undertake a classification of crowds, it may be useful to summarize briefly the main attributes. The following four traits are important. The crowd always wants to grow. There are no natural boundaries to its growth. Where such boundaries have been artificially created, e.g. in all institutions which are used for the preservation of closed crowds, an eruption of the crowd is always possible and will in fact happen from time to time. There are no institutions which can be absolutely relied upon to prevent the growth of the crowd once and for all. Hillsborough. Within the crowd, there is equality. It is absolute and indisputable and never questioned by the crowd itself. It is of fundamental importance and one might even define a crowd as a state of absolute equality. A head is a head, an arm is an arm. The differences between individual heads and arms are irrelevant. It is for the sake of this equality that people become a crowd and they tend to overlook anything which might detract from it. All demands for justice and all theories of equality ultimately derive their energy from the actual experience of equality that's familiar to anyone who has been a part of a crowd. Three, the crowd loves density. Density. It can never feel too dense. Nothing must stand between its parts or divide them. Everything must be the crowd itself. The feeling of density is strongest in the moment of discharge. One day it may be possible to determine this density more accurately and even measure it. The crowd needs a direction. Number four, it is in movement and it moves towards a goal. The direction, which is common to all its members, strengthens the feeling of equality. A goal outside the individual members and common to all of them derives underground all the private differing goals which are fatal to the crowd as such. Direction is essential for the continued existence of the crowd. Its constant fear of disintegration means that it will accept any goal. A crowd exists so long as it has an unattained goal. There is, however, another tendency hidden in the crowd, which appears to lead to new and superior kinds of formation. The nature of these is not is often not predictable. Each of these four attributes will be found in any crowd together to a greater or lesser degree. How a crowd is classified will depend on which of them predominates it. Okay. I've discussed open and closed crowds and just explain that these terms refer to their growth. The crowd is open so long as its growth is not impeded. It's closed when its growth is limited. Another distinction is that between rhythmic and stagnating crowds, this refers to the next two attributes, equality and density, and to both of them simultaneously. The stagnating crowd lives for its discharge, but it feels certain of this and puts it off. It desires a relatively long period of density to prepare for the moment of discharge. It, so to speak, warms itself at its density and delays as long as possible with the discharge. The processing, the process here starts not with equality, but with density. 
and equality then becomes the main goal of the crowd, which in the end it reaches. Every shout, every utterance in common is a valid expression of this equality. In the rhythmic crowd, on the other hand, for example, the crowd of the dance, density and quality coincide from the beginning. Everything here depends on movement. All the physical stimuli involved function in a predetermined manner and are passed on from one dance dancer to another. Density is embodied in the formal reoccurrence of repeat and approach. Equality is manifest in the movements themselves, and thus by the skillful enactment of dens density and equality, a crowd feeling is endangered. These rhythmic formations spring up very quickly, and it is only physical exhaustion which brings them to an end. The next pair of concepts, the slow and the quick crowd, refer exclusively to the nature of the goal. The conscientious crowd, which are the ones usually mentioned and which form such an essential part of modern life, the political, sporting, warlike crowds we see daily are all quick crowds. Very different from these are the religious crowds whose goal is a heaven or crowds formed of pilgrims. Their goal is distant, the way to it long, and the true formation of the crowd is regulated to a far off country or another world. Of these slow crowds, we generally actually see only the attributes for the end they strive after is invisible and not to be attained by the unbelieving. The slow crowd gathers slowly and only sees itself as permanent in a far distance. This is a mere indication of the nature of these forms. We shall have to consider them more closely. So, uh, Ilias's uh, book uh, covers all different types of uh, crowds and uh, its composition. So, for example, it talks about invisible crowds, baiting crowds, flight crowds, reversal crowds, feast crowds, the double crowd, war, crowd crystals. It talks about the pack, hunting pack, the war pack, the lamenting pack, the increased pack, the communion, the pack's determination and historical permanence of packs, packs in the ancestor legends of the Aranda. It looks at um, packs and religion, which I'll go on to briefly. Um, talks about survivor packs, the survivor, survival and invulnerability, survival as a passion, the ruler as survivor, the escape of Josephus, the despot's hostility to survivors, forms of survival, elements of power, force and power, African kings, discipline and the string of command, all sorts of forms of, of power, all sorts of forms of crowds. I don't think that if you're, say, in the police force or if you're a politician, you can escape without reading this book, Crowds and Power. It actually got a Nobel Peace Prize in the early 1980s. I'm going to read one final section of the book, uh, which caught my eye, actually. The book was written in 1981, and yet it has one small chapter, and I'll read out the title. Islam as a religion of war. Devote Mohammedans assemble in four ways, four different ways. They assemble several times daily for prayer, summoned by a voice from on high. The small rhythmic groups form on these occasions may be called prayer packs. Each movement is exactly prescribed and orientated in one direction, towards Mecca. Once a week at the Friday prayer, these packs grow to crowds. They assemble for the holy war against unbelievers. Number three, they assemble in Mecca during the great pilgrimage. Number four, they assemble at the last judgment. As in all religions, invisible crowds are, the greatest, are of the greatest importance. But in Islam, more strongly than in any other world religions, these are invisible double crowds standing in opposition to each other. When the trumpet of the last judgment sounds, the dead all arise from their graves and rush 
to the field of judgment, like men rallying to the standard. There they take up their station before God in two mighty crowds separated from each other, the faithful on one side and the unbelieving on the other, and each individual is judged by God. All the generations of men are thus assembled, and each man, it seems as though he had only just been buried the day before. None has any notion of the immeasurable spaces of time he may have lain in his grave. His death has been without dream or remembrance, but the sound of the trumpet is heard by all. On that day, second. so on that day, men will come in the scattered bands. On that day, we will let them come in tumultuous throngs. The bands and the throngs of this great movement reoccur repeatedly in the Quran. It is the most comprehensive idea of a crowd the Mohammedan, the Mohammedan can imagine. No one can conceive of a larger number of human beings than those of those who have ever lived. And here they are pressed together, closely together in one spot. This is the only crowd which cannot grow. And it is also the densest for each single man stands face to face with his judge. But notwithstanding its size and density, it remains from the beginning to end divided into two. Each man knows what he may expect. There is hope for some and terror for others. On that day, there shall be beaming faces, smiling and joyful. On that day, there will be faces veiled with darkness, covered with dust. Those shall be the faces of the wicked and the unbelieving. Since the justice of the sentence is absolute, for each deed has been recorded and can be proved in writing, no one can escape from that half of the crowd to which he rightfully belongs. The bipartisan partition of the crowd in Islam is unconditional. The faithful and the unbelieving are fated to be separate forever and to fight each other. The war of religion is a sacred duty. And thus, though in a less comprehensive form, the double crowd of the last judgment is prefigured in every earthly battle. The Mohammedan has a very different image in mind when he thinks of another no less sacred duty, the pilgrimage to Mecca. This is a slow crowd formed gradually by tributes from many different countries. Depending on the distance of the faithful from Mecca, it can stretch over weeks, months, even years. The obligation to perform this journey at least once in a lifetime colours a man's whole earthly existence. Anyone who has not been on this pilgrimage is not really has not really lived. The experience of it draws together, so to speak, the whole territory over which the faith has spread and assembles in the place where it originated. The crowd of pilgrims is peaceful and wholly devoted to the attainment of its goal. Its task is not to subjugate infidels, but simply to reach the appointed place to have been there. It is regarded as quite special miracle that a city the size of Mecca should be able to contain the multitudes, multitudes of pilgrims. Uh, Ibn Yabaya, the Spanish Moor, who was in Mecca as a pilgrim at the end of the 12th century and who left a detailed description of it, was of the opinion that not even the largest city in the world could hold so many people. But Mecca, he thought, was endowed with a special facility of expansion and should be compared to the womb, which grows smaller or larger according to the size of the fetus it contains. The greatest movement of the pilgrimage is the day, or moment of the pilgrimage, is the day of the plain of Arafat. 700,000 people are supposed to assemble there. If the number falls short of this, it is made up by angels who stand invisible among the people. But when the days of peace are over, the holy war comes into its own again. Muhammad, says one of the greatest experts on Islam, is the prophet of fighting and of war. What he first achieved in his Arabian sphere, he leaves as a testament for the future of his community. 
the fight against the infidels, the expansion, not so much of the faith as its sphere of power, which is the sphere of power of Allah. What matters to the fighters for Islam is not so much the conversion as the subjugation of infidels. The Quran, the book of the prophet inspired by God, leaves no doubt of this. When the sacred months are over, slay the idolaters, wherever you find them. Arrest them, besiege them, and lie in ambush for them. So, that was a, a brief read by uh, Elias uh, Canetti and his book, The uh, Crowds and Power. It's a good book, worth a read. Uh, here in the, <laughs> the sermon, here finishes Jack and Ori. I hope you enjoyed it. If you do, feel free to buy me a coffee or like and subscribe. Over and out.